you have your Bibles with you this morning, you'll be turning to the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. While you're turning there, I forgot to mention, um, there will be a meeting in two weeks at the Olmstead Baptist Church, beginning on the evening of the 1st, all day Friday the 2nd, and then on the morning of Saturday the 3rd. And so, if you're interested, there's going to be a number of speakers, and um, so you pray for that meeting. Ephesians chapter 3 uh, we're going to begin reading in verse 11. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 11, the Bible says, According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which, which is for your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length, and the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, and that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him it is able to be exceeding, and unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think, according to his power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, World without end. Amen. Yeah. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and your watch care to us. Lord, we pray that you would watch over us as a people, that you guide me as pastor, Lord, that we might lead this people in the right direction, Lord, that you keep us from evil. This morning we pray that you would bless and that you would honor your word, Lord, that you would uh, cause us to understand and know your will. Pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture. And I want you, and we're going to look at the whole text again, but I want you to understand that what Paul wanted for the Ephesus church is to be encouraged in trouble. It is to be solid in the face of adversity. Because what's going to be coming is not going to be pleasant. You know, we live in a day and age where everybody is telling you how much better things are getting. Well, dear friend, things are not getting any better. In fact, our government is on the downslide. And you, we need to, to focus and understand on spiritual things. Because when we shift our focus to worldly things... And worldly situations, that is when we become discouraged. But if we focus on spiritual things, right. we can be renewed in the Holy Ghost right. and be happy exactly where we're at. Uh, and, and so we find is uh, we're about, about in the middle of the letter to the Ephesus church that Paul begins to remind them of some things concerning his personal tribulation. Now... You need to think about yourself, and it's a spiritual barometer or a spiritual meter of how you're doing is uh, what kind of tribulations do you face? Because you know, you know why Paul faced so much tribulation? It's because he was out and he was preaching and he was telling others of Christ. If he had sat at home and sat under the basket and never said anything, you know what? He wouldn't have had no tribulations. Would he have been saved? I'm supposing so. He had an experience on the road to Damascus that speaks of salvation, but what really tells me concerning Paul's salvation is not what happened, but what happened after. And what you need to evaluate in yourself is what happened after. After you were born again, what happened then? So we know what happened to Paul. He went out about preaching the word of God and he was cast out in cities. He was stoned 
He was uh, shipwrecked. And all that because of his preaching, of his testimony, of what he did. So as Paul is writing to the Ephesus church, he says, listen, don't you be discouraged in that. According to the eternal purpose. Now, why are you here this morning? Did you come out of routine? Did you come because it's Sunday morning? Did you come because someone made you? Why did you come? Well, I can tell you this. You can put all that aside. And yes, somebody may have drug you in. Somebody said, well, Brother Larry, be mad if I don't go. But why you're here this morning is because of the eternal purpose of God. It is no surprise to him that you're here. It is no accident that you arrived here this morning. But rather, you're here to hear the preaching because of the Almighty God placed you in this situation and in this circumstance. According to the eternal purpose which he, meaning God, proposed, proposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, you hear of the death of Christ today, and some mob attacked him and pulled him away and took his life from him. That's not true. He poured it out. You, you remember when they were going to capture the Lord Jesus Christ, John's accounting of that, and, and he said, Who seek you? And they fell backwards on their back because of the strength and the power and the word of Christ. And, and, and so he willingly yielded himself to that. And Paul's saying, listen, that happened for our good. That, that happened for our eternal benefit. Uh, no one taking anything, but rather the Lord Jesus Christ willingly offering it. Verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith of him. Now I ask you a number of questions concerning verse 12. Do you have boldness? Uh, again, I, I personally believe that is a spiritual barometer. If you have boldness or if you don't. Now, I know not everybody's loud like me. Loud, loud don't equate with bold. But are you bold to tell the story of Christ? Uh, Paul said we have boldness through God our Father. And so, if we don't have boldness... Could we not equate that we don't? <clears throat> Could we not equate maybe we're not plugged into God like we thought we were? And, and, and so we find that what uh, Paul really is writing of is it, it, spiritual elements that ought to be there if we've really been saved. In whom we have boldness and access, and access with confidence by the faith of him. Now, I want you to see it wasn't the faith of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Paul that he was having this boldness, but the faith of Christ, by the faith of him. Now, he didn't say by the faith of me. He said by the faith of him, meaning Christ. So how is your faith? Is it in you or is it in Christ? Do you have boldness or do you sit behind uh, your chair and and, and, uh, and and scared what the next next thing's going to flash on the headlines. What well, where are you at in, in in that spiritual walk with the Lord? And, and Paul said, "Listen, I'm bold because of the Lord. I, I'm happy. I, I am glad because of Him." Verse thirteen. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your which is your glory. Now, he tells them th two things. Don't quit. Now, listen, in the season which we live, and we see more people going than staying, don't quit. Yeah. Don't quit. That, that is what the devil would have. You know, me and that brother Richard was talking about uh, this yesterday, and, and don't ever get into the mind, don't ever get in this mindset, because if you do, you'll quit or you'll go somewhere larger. Don't equate success by numbers. Equate success by if God's meeting with us or not. Now, if he's not, we're failing somehow, right? But if he does, if he blesses the preaching of the word of God, if he blesses the singing, if you feel his presence, then stick with it. Yeah. And if you don't, you know what? Uh, don't. 
And, and so what? Uh, so we find then that as Paul is writing, he says, I want you to be glad, not upset that I'm in prison, not upset that they're going to take my head, but be glad. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not in my tribulations for you, which is your glory. In other words, that's your light. That's why you're shining. You know what? I've never been arrested yet out of my street preaching ministry. I've had uh, a few things happen to me, but nobody's threatened to, to arrest me. But if I do, it's to your glory. Don't, don't be upset at me. I hope that you come bail me out if they'll set a bail. But don't, don't be upset. You know, you know what's equated with that today if someone's arrested for street preaching? That man's a quack. Now tell me if I'm wrong. Right? That man's an idiot. That man's an embarrassment. Right? And, 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 and you know what? You know who's taught us to think that way? This world. And you know what? This, the, the sad part about it is this. There's more quacks out there that are doing it than us. Right? And, and, and so with those two things together, we, we see in the modern day that uh, we would probably look at it like the Ephesus church was looking at it. And, and instead, of, instead of being bold and say, hey, that's to our glory. That's to our, our understanding. That's to our benefit. We get embarrassed. We, we, we began to pull back a little bit. So he says, don't do this. Verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all the reasons, so you won't get scared, so you won't give up, so you won't quit. I'm praying for you, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Now, I want to point out to you that if you need strength, it's not going to come from yourself. If you need strength, yes, get in the book, but also read what we just read. Your strength comes from the spirit, capital S, spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, you down and out, all I know to tell you is get plugged in. And the only way that Paul was writing was prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Now, when I say that, we're reading, we're reading a letter from the New Testament. But remember this, the New Testament was just beginning as he wrote this. Do you know that part of the letters... Are older than the Gospels. That, that wasn't written in sequence. How it's sequenced in your King James Bible. They were written at all different times. And, and, and so. How were they getting plugged in. When the word of God wasn't even available. The New Testament wasn't even available to them yet. The only way that I can see from this text. They were plugged in by prayer. And, and so he reminds them, listen, pray uh, that you be not discouraged. Pray that you don't quit. Pray that this won't be an embarrassment to you. Pray, pray, pray. Verse 17. For this call, for that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Now, I ask you this. How many of you rooted and grounded? Now, when, when a plant first takes root, it ain't going to bear fruit right away. It's going to take a number of years. But he wanted these individuals to be rooted and grounded. You know why people quit going to church? They're not rooted and they're not grounded. What happens to a tree, a new tree, if it's not well rooted yet, and a real strong wind comes by? It's going to rip it up and go with it, right? Are you rooted and grounded? You know, uh, uh, you will see this as time goes by. Uh, you ought to be able to tell it. Now, Rooted and grounded don't necessarily mean it's, it's not a measure of how long you've been in church either. Um, 
I've seen some pretty flimsy stuff, and they sat there for 40 or 50 years. So uh, if you're rooted and grounded, uh, Paul says that's what's going to keep you going when these things begin to come to pass. Are you rooted and grounded? And again, I can't answer that for you, but you can. And I would, I would, I would, if I were you, I would want to know what kind of faith do I really have? Now, if you are rooted and grounded, verse 19 begins some blessings that only the rooted and the grounded, grounded understand. And to know the love of Christ. Now, listen, I like good Bible doctrine, and you know, we could get on that all night, but you know what I like better than that is the love of Christ. You know what I like better than election and predestination is the love of Christ. You know what I like better than knowing what the church is all about? I want the love of Christ. It, it, it extends beyond that, does it not? In fact, does not, does not the whole thing grow out of the love of Christ? Can you imagine an omnipotent, all-powerful, all-present, ever-has-been deity coming down to the world, coming down to this ungodly world, and pouring out himself for the ungodly like us? Yeah. What could be better than the love of Christ? Yeah. Uh, there, there, there's no, there's nothing. There's nothing better than, you, you know, right at Gethsemane and right before Gethsemane, he he went out and prayed. And, and, and you know, uh, I, I, I can't quite get my mind around this sometimes. But you know, all of Christ's prayer was not answered. Do you know that? All of them were not answered. He said, Peter, I pray for thee that thy faith fail not. And you know what? It did fail. Did it not? I don't know the man. I don't even know what you're talking about. It failed, right? So you know what? He really did take on humanity, did he not? He really did. The very omnipotent, all-powerful being put on this filthy, ungodly flesh and at times was denied. But you know what? Uh... <laughs> That's part of the love, is it not? That he would be willing to do that. The mighty God of all heaven. Willing to do that. And, and, and so we find then that um, what Paul wanted them to focus on, instead of being discouraged, instead of being embarrassed by the preaching of the word of God, but rather still... You, you, you focus on trying to understand the love wherewith he loved you. Verse 18, that you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, breadth or the, the width and the, and the length and the depth and the height. Now, I'm going to focus on one thing. Uh, the depth or the deepness or the, the mass of the love of Christ. Uh, the rest of it is beyond understanding. But how deep that love is, 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 is the most difficult for me to understand. How he would be willing to do and come and accomplish what he did. Uh, he bought salvation for me. You, you know what I deserve? I deserve to be cast alive into hell. Is what the Bible says. Yeah. But someone intervened. I, I, I deserve. And you know, we, we really get down on Achan and his crew, crew that rebelled against Moses. And you know what the Bible says against Achan and that bunch? The earth opened their mouth and swallowed them up and they went alive into hell. That's what we deserve. I don't care how goody tooty you are, we deserve hell righteously. Yeah. Correctly. That, that's where we belong. But Christ intervened. And you know what? God the Father, Jehovah, He could have accomplished it, 
But he said, I'll, I'll send my son. And don't, don't ever get to thinking that Christ was a created being because he was just as omnipotent and just as everlasting as God the Father. So, so he clothed himself willingly. And, and he said, Father, I'll go. I'll, I'll pour myself out. Uh, uh, <laughs> That's why when he said it was finished, it was done. People who believe in progressive salvation, they really deny the sufficiency of Christ, do they not? That they would have to. Because they, they're really saying one time's not enough, right? You go back to the cross. You, you go and offer some more. No, that's not how it is. It, it, it is completely and fully of Christ. And so we find then, uh, as Paul is writing, he says, I want you to understand a little bit about how much he loved you. And that's what I want for you this morning. I want you to understand a little bit of how Christ loved you. I want you to, st uh, to study and to, and to pray and, and, and to settle on and to seek just a little bit of that depth on ending love that Christ had for you. Verse 19. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now notice what he says, and to know the love of Christ, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. Now, why are so many empty today? When, when you travel from place to pray, place to preach, I can tell you of a surety there's some empty people out there. Just because they arrive at the house of God uh, routinely don't make them full. Just, be, you know, out, out in the street preaching ministry, listen, I, I see lives, you can look at them and know there's nothing there. Have you ever thought for a minute, a moment, a minute, the redeemed, it's hard for you to do it, how empty your life would be without Christ. You know, I guess if you didn't have Christ, I'd understand why all you do is go after money. If you didn't have Christ, if you have a five-bedroom, I want a six. Because you don't, that's where you're trying to get your fullness. But Paul said to the church, I want you to understand the fullness of Christ. I want you to understand who he is and what he is and what he did, I want you to understand that. Now, unto him that is able to do exceedingly, exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. Now, that's our real text verse this morning, and this is what you consider on the love of Christ. What do you think that God can do? Now, I want you to call, call your attention that it does say think. It didn't ask what faith do you have. And we preached on faith, I think it was last week. Very recently anyway. But what do you think God can do? Well, Paul writing to the church in Ephesus right here, he says he can do exceedingly above what you ask or think. What do you think he can do? You think he can move mountains? I think he can. Do you think he could cause me to walk the Cumberland River? I think he can. And, and you know, sad to say in the modern day, who that type of belief is resting on is Pentecostal people. So what do you think he can do? Now, on the flip side of that, if we, look, if we look, use this part of us, I think, let's be honest, the only way for me to get from one side of the Cumberland River to the other side of the Cumberland River is to swim. Right? Now, in the modern day, 
I, at one time, I could actually swim across the river at Cumberland City. Now, the river channel's narrower there than it is at Dover. Uh, but I really could. At 50 years old, I don't think I would try it because I would probably drown. So I would choose to cross the Cumberland River on that nice arched bridge that we all go across, right? Or if I wanted to, I'd go down to Cumberland City and I'd drive my truck onto the ferry and I'd cross that way. And do you know why? It's been my experience that that works. That's what I think. So, what about you? Now, uh, what I have to come to here, and what I think Paul was turning, what was trying to teach Ephesus, is we need to change our thinker. We need to change how we think. Can God fill this building? I think He can. Can God empty this building? I know He can. See, we always want to think along the lines of success, don't we? But sometimes it doesn't work that way, does it? You think it worked that way for Achan and his bunch? Don't think it did. But was that a move of God? Sure it was. Yeah. And, and, and so we see then, if we're going to experience the this love of God, because what grows out of the love of God is deliverance. What, what grows out of the love of God is miraculous, unbelievable things that we comprehend. We cannot comprehend and understand. That's what grows out of this love that Paul was writing to the Ephesus church about. Uh, and then he says that we could ask or think. Now very briefly, I want to get into the asking part because we don't... Uh, what, what did the Lord say in his own ministry? You have not because you ask not. Right? What have you asked for this week? I've asked for, sadly enough, and, and selfishly enough, one thing. My knee, my ankle, it's back to baseline. And uh, Tuesday, I was in a wheelchair. He's able to do exceedingly above I could ask or think. You, you know what my request was? I just want to be able to walk without hurting. And I, I just jumped, what, maybe two feet off the ground and came down pain free. Exceedingly above you could ask or think. So then I'd have to begin to wonder what have you asked for? What have you requested? What, what have you put before the throne? Now, ladies, gentlemen, I began thinking about a lot of things we asked for. Men, you might ask for a new car. Uh, ladies, you might ask for pearls. Uh, what would you ask or think about? So, I will say this, he can give you anything, but he's going to give you what's good for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do you ask or think? And, and so, we're going to look at a couple of cases very quickly, uh, where they ask, but I wonder what they were thinking. I wonder what they were really had in the back of their minds. Now, go with me uh, to First Chronicles. Uh, and we're going to look at a, an instance uh, from David, uh, First Chronicles, uh, chapter number 21. And David did a thing that was very outside the will of God, and, and what it was was taking a census. Now, uh, being somewhat of a genealogy buff, uh, Matthew was looking, because we were talking about sending it up, uh, an invitation card or really a trap to everybody in Stewart County. And uh, he was looking at the number of households here in Stewart County. And it's about 4,000, close to 5,000 households. And as he was looking on there, he said, uh, you know when the Stewart County's population was the largest? And I said 1,900. 
And it was sad on me. I get it. It's my hobby, but I knew it like that. Uh, was it good? You know, the Lord's never told us not to do a census in the modern age. But you know what it usually is? It's bragging rights. And that was really David's thing. It was to brag, hey, I've got this many followers. But the thing that happened with David, he didn't have them for long. Because his own son rebelled against him, right? And, 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 and so we find then that David does this census. He, he, and and then, he, then God begins to judge. And we're going to pick it up in 1 Chronicles 21, verse 16. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and heaven, having drawn a sword in his hand, stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. Now, can you imagine looking up into the sky that we see and see a great angel with a sword pointed at the United States, pointed at China? But it was he had it drawn on the apple of his eye. He had it drawn on Jerusalem. He had it drawn on Israel. And it brought them to their knees. It brought them face down. You know what? The very judgment of God today, don't, uh, don't, it don't bring anybody. In other words, and, and if anything, it's a mockery, right? And, and, and so we find then, as, uh, as uh, the history goes, that they were that he appeared unto them. And, and the result was that, you know what? I think, I, I hope that I would fall flat on my face too. That, that I just go before God and, and fall out because of his reverence and his holiness. Verse 17, and David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I, uh, even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, meaning his people, have, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house. But not on the people that they should be plagued. Now, I ask you this, would you do that? You, you know, take the brunt of your own sin. You know, I have to respect David a great deal because he says, hey, listen, it was me. Uh, uh, I, I'll accept this. It, it was my fault. And the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David, and David, that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Orem, uh, of Ornan, the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of Gad, and I will point out that he talked to Gad, he didn't talk to David. You, you know when, you know what's the best of measure if you're in or out of the will of God, is God talking to you. If he's not talking you, to you through the Holy Spirit, you may be right where David was. So Gad, he had, the message had to come through another. And he spake in the name of the Lord, and Ornan turned back and saw the angel. So I want you to see that Ornan saw this threatening judgment as well. And his four sons, which hid themselves, now Ornan was threshing wheat. And as David came to the Ornan, Ornan looked up. And saw David and went out of the out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David in his and, and with his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, Grant me uh, the place of this threshing floor that I may build an altar thereon unto the Lord, that thou shalt grant it me for the full price. Now I'm going to insert here that repentance cost a price. Now. First of all, it's going to cross the price. If you repent and be, you know, and that was the first message of John the Baptist. And it was for the first message of the Lord Jesus Christ was repent and be saved. Yeah. So, but David was in a mode of repentance and he was going to offer a sacrifice. And it was going to cost him something. Now, Ornan, being a good citizen and a lover of David said, you just take what you want. And he said, no, no. It's got to cost me something. 
You, you know what repentance is going to cost you? Pride. You, you know why people don't confess sin anymore? Pride. It'll cost them something. It'll be something involved. Right? And, 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 and so we find there uh, that Ornan, <laughs> trying to be nice, but what Ornan really was being was an opposer. He, he, he was being unwittingly <coughs> in uh, not in the right will and giving David the cost. Verse 25, so David gave Ornan for the, for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight, and David built there an altar unto the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called upon the name of the Lord, and he, meaning God, answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of the burnt offering. Now, I want you to see that this is a very unusual circumstance when the holy fire of God came down and consumed it. Now, there's two other, there's two other instances that happened. The initial sacrifice in the wilderness tabernacle, God accomplished that. And when Elijah went up against the 400 prophets of Baal, it happened there too. But, see, there's forgiveness in God. He, he, he thought it was going to be regular worship. Right? I'm sorry, Lord. How many times have you had to say that? How many times have you had to say that? How many times have you had to say that? And we find him being merciful again. And so merciful, he sent his own fire down and consumed it up. And uh, David was back in the will of the Lord. So we find then <laughs> that sometimes that the Lord does this greatness. You, you know what David thought it was going to be? He thought it was going to be routine. But you know what? God did exceeding and above. He came down and he met with him. He came down and he sucked it up himself. He came down and burned it. Exceeding and above all we ask or think. That's the God of the Bible. Now I want to I wanna show you one more place. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit. In the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter number 3, verse 16, very familiar verses of Scripture. But I want to point out a couple of things. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 16, the Bible says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Now in the book of Ephesians where we just read, what was Paul's hope for the church at Ephesus? I want you to be bold. And the way to be bold is to get close to Christ. I want you to be bold. So we find centuries earlier that Daniel says, listen, <laughs> uh, I mean, Nebu uh, Shadrach and Meshach and Bendigo, they were bold. They said, listen, we're not even thinking about this. We're not careful about what we say. We're not going to mince words. We're going to tell you how it is. And, and, and the, the answer to what it was, how it was, is we're not going to bow. We, we, we do not, this is not the God of the Bible. This is not what he, that he told us to do. Uh, we're not going to do it. Verse 17. If it so be, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. They believed it was all that, more than they could ask or think. It was above that. <clears throat> we believe that. You know what? They believed that. They, they understood God was able. Verse 18, But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. Was he happy? Was he glad that God's people were serving God? No. The world will always hate that. The world will always be upset. And listen, uh, it ain't going to be whom you think it's from. You know what? Sometimes mama and daddy get upset when you choose to serve God. 
If you really go by this Bible and you begin to cut some things out of your life that they hold sacred, listen, you're going to kick up a little dust on the way to the promised land. And so we find that Nebuchadnezzar was upset. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, then they brought them, the men before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I set up? Now, if you be ready, and they get their final opportunity. I'll give you one more chance. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Uh, and again, they believe that he, that he is able. Uh, verse 25. Uh, we'll, we'll hit verse 23. And these, and, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were bound into the midst of uh, of a burning fiery furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said, True, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Not God, the Son of God. So we see Christ was in existence way before Bethlehem. And so uh, we find in just a moment he calls them out. And they walk right out of there. The Bible says there wasn't even the smell of smoke going. See, that's more than more than what they even thought would happen, is it not? So what what do you think God can do? You know what, a lot of times it's really, it's really controlled and cramped by our finite minds, is it not? Right. But I believe he can do anything. Yeah. I, I have to remind myself daily that he can do anything. And this little, this little bit of ankle trouble this week taught me this. He can do anything. Mm -hmm. He can do anything he wants. And, you know, looking back, me and Don talked about it, and me and my fellows at work talked about it, I can't think of one thing I did with that ankle. So all I know is God made it that way for such a time as this. So does that mean God can hurt his own people? Sure it does. He'll bring adversity to you. He'll let the devil go this far, will he not? Absolutely. And, uh, but it would be for your own benefit. So I ask you this morning, what do you believe? Are you hindered? You know what? I see the Lord's people hindered a lot these days. And a lot of times I have to come to this conclusion. They don't really believe that anymore. They don't believe that he can do it more exceedingly than we ask or think. What have you asked for him from him lately? And I, I think to ask correctly then, we have to think that he'll do it. Right? What have you asked for? What have you requested from? What have you brought before the throne? Uh, I would suggest you do that.